ladies and gentlemen, from the site where legends are made, Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, wearing their white trunks with red trim, and weighing in at 233 pounds. Ladies and gentlemen, from Eastern Pennsylvania, the challenger, former heavyweight champion of the world, the Eastern Assassin, Larry And his opponent fighting out of the blue corner, wearing the gold trunks with white trim, weighing in at an even 210 pounds. Ladies and gentlemen, from Atlanta, Georgia, the two-time world champion and current undefeated, undefeated, heavyweight champion of the world, Evander. One night, a man can make $20 million in boxing, or he can lose his life in boxing. I've seen three men die in front of me. I've seen them carried out of the ring, and the next fight go on. It's like war, and, and war is a business. War is a very profitable business. And once you've seen that, you understand that uh, it's very little difference in that and the Roman Colosseum. No difference, except perhaps uh, the rate of exchange. It's a very tough business. It's sort of the law of the jungle, where the most fit survive. It is business and the free enterprise system at its best and at its worst. It is uncontrolled mayhem and confusion and he who is best able to handle the mayhem and confusion normally exceeds best this isn't just a fight this is the fight for the heavyweight championship of the world it's worth 50 or 60 million dollars and not only the heavyweight championship just the position it gives you in the industry and uh, that's a tremendous risk somebody asked me um, do I bet on fights? I said, I bet a lot more than anyone else that can imagine. When you got the heavyweight champion of the world, you got a 400 pound gorilla up there. You are the boss of boxing. Dan is very smart because he looks forward. Many people in boxing look at peace at a time. Dan is already thinking about the next couple of years. The business of boxing is like a chess game. It's moving deals around. It's moving pieces around. And Dan is very good at moving those pieces a year out. To be the promoter of the heavyweight champion of the world is a great thing to have in boxing. And uh, he has been operating on the basis that he is the promoter of the heavyweight champion of the world. If, if as I hope tonight, Larry Holmes uh, beats a van the Holyfield. When Dan wakes up tomorrow morning, he will no longer be the promoter of the heavyweight champion of the world, and that's a big difference. My name is Michael Morley. I'm an attorney, I'm a boxing manager. Boxing is my business. I wonder if your uh, heavyweight, uh, Mr. Quintana, might be available for a fight Saturday night in Troy, New York, against my guy, Shannon Briggs. It's, it's a four-round fight, but I, well, but I'll pay, uh, you know, I'll pay, uh, I'm willing to pay him uh, 600. I don't want to see my guy get beat. My, my, my kid's only 3 and 0, oh, and uh, Shannon's uh, got three, you know, he's only, he hasn't fought three complete rounds. He's had all whack outs. Shannon uh, used to read my columns in the Post, and he said it was trash, so he told me to get a job. <laughs> see you later, man. All right. I was planning on leaving the newspaper and going into boxing uh, management, so 
I was most interested in, you know, having a heavyweight. Here's a guy from New York. Shannon's a very articulate guy. You know, he got a good sense of humor. There was another manager who was, uh, at that point, I was still a journalist, but this, there was a couple of managers out there. They were all over Shannon like a cheap suit, following him around, you know. When Shannon went to the men's room, they went to the men's room. Or Shannon, we, we, you know, we're staying at this hotel, that hotel. So I could see Shannon was, you know, the sharks were uh, starting to circle him. So I seen him at the fights, and I was like, you know, I was in need of a manager, kind of like someone just to look out, you know, help me out, because at the time, I needed some, like, sponsorship. So, um, I seen Mike and I asked him, could he help me out? He said, give him a call. Anyway, uh, oh, that's a Hotel Chelsea. That's where Sid Vicious, uh, remember Sid Vicious, man? Yeah. Punk rock guy? Yeah, that's, oh. where, that's where he uh, wound up his career. Anyway, uh, Sid Vicious reminds me of you because that's what you are in the ring, Vicious. See how that girl went by? It's only in New York. They look at see the TV thing. Who the fuck is that guy? I don't know him. He ain't shit. You know, any other city, they go, like in Lexington, Kentucky, they're, oh, we saw you on TV last night. I took Shannon under my wing. I helped him financially, uh, you know, keep going as an amateur. I took him around the tournaments. No, no. By the time Shannon Briggs fights for the World Heavyweight title, that'll be, let's say, three years down the line. Between myself and my partner, Mark Roberts, we will have invested uh, seven figures into the career of uh, Shannon Briggs without a financial return. I think Mike Marley is uh, one of the most reprehensible people in a business, i.e. boxing, that attracts an unusually high percentage of reprehensible people. But uh, I think uh, from my personal experiences with him and from talking to many of his colleagues and other people in the business who know him, uh, that he's a snake. Michael Marley was a writer, boxing writer, and a good one. He worked for the New York Post for years. We sat and watched many a fight together. And um, I think he went on to law school. Net little did I know that Mike planned on getting involved, but it was really kind of a smart move on his part, I think, because he was looking around at these other managers and promoters, and he was saying, hey, if these people can do it, why can't I? Now, I don't know if he's become cynical in any way or jaded in any way. I think you have to lose a little bit of your humanity to get involved with it at that level. I, I went head over heels for boxing because of one person. His name was Cassius Marcellus Clay. But of course, then he became Muhammad Ali. I called Shannon up. I said, you know what you're going to do Tuesday? So I'm going to get up. I'm going to run. I'm going to go to the gym. I said, uh, anything else? He said, not that I know of. I said, how about meeting Muhammad Ali? He said, get out of here. Don't, he says, don't even joke around like that. He says, if you're not serious. I said, Bobby Goodman's got Muhammad Ali coming in the garden. I was such an Ali fan as a young guy, and I had a, uh, a, a fleeting career as an amateur boxer. Float like a butterfly, sting like a moth was my uh, motto. I uh, started a fan club for him when I was a young guy, and I started imitating. I started doing, you know, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Your hands can't hit what your eyes can't see. Anyway, uh, Ali said to me, are you a little white boy or are you a little colored boy? I said, would that make a difference to you? He said, no, not really. You remember him? <laughs> How do you feel? Of all time. Of all time. <laughs> Champ. Shannon's 3-0 heavyweight. He was national amateur champion. Would have been in the Olympics, but he hurt his hand. He can go. <laughs> I told him, I said, today we're going to go meet Muhammad Ali. He said, you must be kidding. Don't joke around like that. If you're not serious, you see, now you got him mad. Sorry about that. Thanks, champ. Let's see. The best. Yeah, it's been all time. 
Good to see you. Thanks, Mohammed. Hey, how you doing? Howard, thank you. Yeah, just as some... Did you snap some pictures? Yeah. I got a good one. Like that. That's, right. Troy, get up. That's my name? He said, if I fought you, I'd call you pretty lady. <laughs> Shannon no. says glad he didn't fight him. He didn't want to be known for that. Yo, that's a good thing I didn't fight him, man. And that's when we'll do the uh, photo opportunities there. Afterwards, you'll be going upstairs. I believe that he felt as though him being Muhammad Ali, he owed it to the people to come back as many times as he did. You know, they say boxing is addictive. I don't really feel as though the same thing would happen to me because with the money we're making in boxing now, the millions and hopefully billions one day, Shannon Briggs won't do that, no matter what. I mean, I won't have to. Yeah, I know, it's bad. Yeah, Shannon. Dick Schaap, ABC, Shannon Briggs. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet Richard Whatever form of entertainment, you have to build an aura. You have to build an image. That's what we're doing with Shannon Briggs. These things don't happen by accident. Uh, they're by calculation and by design. And it's all primed to build up the legend of Shannon Briggs. <laughs> <You're big old laughs> if Shannon Briggs becomes a multi-millionaire, I'll become a millionaire. If Shannon Briggs becomes a multi-jillionaire, I'll become a multi-millionaire. Uh, my success is tied to his. <laughs> father was always involved in professional boxing in one way or another and uh, as far back as I can remember I can remember Rocky Marciano at my house when I was five or six years old so I can remember boxing as far back as I can remember anything I remember uh, getting a uh, Christmas present, a toy, when I was um, seven or eight years old, really loving it. And then, uh, like the next day, looking for it, and I couldn't find it. And uh, my father had taken it and given it to one of his boxer's kids because his boxer couldn't afford presents for his kid. When my kids were growing up, uh, we spoke three languages in my home. We spoke American, we spoke Italian, and we spoke boxing. That was it. That was it. That, that's, uh, that's the three things they spoke about. These kids didn't have comic books. They didn't read comic books. They read Ring Magazine. They read fight books they read. And even my daughters did the same thing. I mean, even my granddaughter today, Casey, I mean, uh, that's all she does. When you turn pro with Lou Doobie, you don't just turn pro with Lou Doobie. You get Dan Duva as a promoter, uh, possibly Shelly Finkel as a co-manager. In those days, Lou wasn't as liquid. It wasn't a multi-multi-millionaire. Shelly did have the money, so financed a lot of the operations, so they became partners. But then you had Kathy Duva, who was involved in PR, and Donna Duva, and Dino Duva, and Deanne Duva, and a number of cousins that were also on board, and different types of affiliations with networks that they were working with or not working with. So you kind of bought into an entire family, or were tied into it contractually. The good of that is the family's all working together. The bad of that is they're all family and you're not. You still have to come in second no matter what anyone tells you. It's family. And especially with Italians, it's a very, very funny thing, family. Meeting my husband's family for the first time was a frightening experience for me. Um, they, they're, you know, very tight-knit, very close and uh, they will not accept an outsider immediately. And so, uh, like everyone else, I had to work my way in. Um, once they do accept you, however, you know, you're totally accepted and there's never any doubt. 
the laws are. Yeah, it's the laws. I tell everybody, I got two families. I got a blood family. My daughters, my sons, and they're in, and then I got a fistic family with all my fighters, and they mesh with each other. People say I was too small. I didn't believe that. You know, I, I worked through it. People say I'd never be the heavyweight champion of the world, and I always proved them wrong. It's a do and die situation anytime you go in the ring. Because you realize that this other guy is thinking just like you. He feels that he's good. And you know, you think that you're good. And it's a confidence thing. Who will gonna outlast who? And, uh, and I, that's what I like about it. No one control your destiny. Now when, the, when, when the first guy that always give you the trouble with the sneak, that's the one that you got to be jab. Don't let him just be jab. Boom, boom. Larry Holmes was, uh, was a champion of the world for eight years, you know. He's got a world of experience. He is more dangerous than George Foreman. George Foreman had the punch, but he didn't have any boxing knowledge. Yeah, no matter where you hit him, just to be jammed, jammed, jammed. We're going to have to take uh, his uh, experience away from with physical uh, damage. And that's what I intend doing from, uh, from the opening bell. Good jab, good jab, baby, good jab. The last... Uh, the last week I always wish it was over because you've trained hard for two months and you always hope that nothing goes wrong, you know, a hand injury, an eye injury, uh, you twist an ankle or something like that, you know, and, uh, and everything, goes, everything goes down the drain. Another thing that he brought up is something that I know you've heard before. He and Bob Arum have talked about it, is the uh, steroid thing. That uh, there's no way that you could get from light heavyweight to where you are now without the use of steroids. Well, I think they did, they did it for the wrong reason. They did it for a promotion bit. What's the difference? Do I look bigger? Do I look bloated? Do I look like I? You know, you just look at me. I I don't see no muscle ripping out nowhere. I'm in shape. Yeah. Did good, man. I'm telling you, did good. Hey, you won 12 rounds. First time you won 12 rounds. So you want to concentrate on that jab, and you were using the jab. You were using the jab. Your body punching, you didn't do too much. But what you did was good. You're bending down, you're bending down, you're going to the body. You did good. No one falls from a height, the same height that a boxer does when his days of boxing are, are over. No one falls from that sort of height. You have to understand a boxer is coming from the lowest dregs of society nine times out of ten. And then he reaches the absolute pinnacle of society. Um, a fine English fighter, former champion named Randy Turpin, who had a tremendous boxing rivalry with Sugar Ray Robinson once said, what's worse? He, went, he asked Ray, what's worse, Ray, being a has-been or a never was? And then Randy Turpin committed suicide. by the hair, the dreadlocks, and he pulled on his blonde dreadlocks, and he whispered something, and I didn't hear what he said. And Shannon says to me, boy, I'm glad I never fought that guy. I said, why, you don't think you'd be competitive against him? He says, no, did you hear what he told me? He said, if I fought you, I would have given you the nickname Pretty Lady. <laughs> if you can confuse somebody, you got it made. When I was with Kearns, he said to me, confusion is Doc everything. Kearns. Doc yeah, Kearns. Doc Kearns. Doc Kearns and I was with him the last seven years of his life. And he said to me, you got to understand things. These are not lies that are being told. These are tales. You always call it a tale. You don't call it lies. And if you succeed in confusing people, 
You got it made in boxing. Uh, who told you that Randy wouldn't approve the opponent? Ruby did. All right. Well, let me try and get her. I don't. Maybe he gave her a reason. I don't. I don't. I know he's down on these guys from New England, but this guy's no uh, certifiable bum. Randy Gordon, the commissioner, has rejected the opponent, and uh, I guess I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna try and get a hold of Randy right now. Mr. Randy Gordon, my favorite commissioner. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Hey, Randy, let me tell you the situation, and then, you know, I understand you're trying to keep out these uh, the stiffs from New England. Five eleven, one ninety five. He's fought one professional. Round. Randy, if I could find someone better, well, I, I I would accept almost anybody. But but getting somebody at the eleventh hour, et cetera. I'm I've searched uh, New York State and New Jersey, uh, you know, high and low, and and we're not looking for a, a total tomato can or a complete stiff. I'm just really, Randy. I'm uh, I don't want to completely have the knee pads out, but I'm looking for a solution. Uh, I was going to pay the medical exams, too. Um, if you have any suggestions, I know you're not, you know, the matchmaker, you're the commissioner. Quite frankly, Randy, we want a competitive guy, but... Okay. All right, you, you'll, you'll give him a visual uh, once-over, and uh, I'll have him at your office, uh, what, 9 o'clock? Uh, Randy warned me that there's a good chance, if he doesn't like the looks of the guy, he's going to ship him home, and there'll be no fight. The point is to build wins, and it's a rotten, scummy, terrible way to do things, and it's exactly the way Mike Marley operates, and you know what? It's exactly the way I operated as a manager. I was no better than Mike Marley on that level, and no other manager is. It's the nature of the business, and it's wrong and you still have to do it because there is no other system. I make no bones about it. Uh, we do plunder a few graveyards here and there, and uh, we find some barely uh, breathing corpses. That's the time-honored uh, or time-dishonored tradition. And any manager who tells you otherwise is certifiably uh, insane. Welcome to the sewer, gentlemen. That's right. You never go out the way you came in. Watch your hands. Shannon. Marley was smart enough to get Shannon Briggs, one of the best trainers in boxing, a very ethical guy, unlike Mike Marley, a guy named Teddy Atlas. Stay right there. Stay there. Don't pull out. Don't straighten up. Teddy's only in his 30s now. And Teddy really, on a day-to-day -day basis, is the guy who developed Mike Tyson. There it is. Bring the shoulder back and keep working. Create distance. Create distance, Shannon. Bring your shoulder back. Not the head. Not the head, Shannon. The body, Shannon, instead of the head. That's it. Now stay on there. All right, well, easy, easy, easy. As you build a heavyweight contender, uh, the road to the top is long. It's perilous. One misstep uh, can set you back 10 steps. It's also very expensive. Teddy Atlas uh, is well paid, and he, and he should be. Shannon Briggs is also on a monthly salary. Shannon Briggs is also going to receive a very nice Land Rover uh, when he becomes 10 and 0. He's already 3 and 0. Uh, that's a motivating factor for Shannon Briggs. And everyone involved will make money. You're a young man, but hopefully a man. You stop this crap when I tell you not to run to run. You stop this not showing up on time making your appointment. You make your damn appointments. 
You hear me? Because yeah. I'm not going to be involved with someone who's not going to do that. You know why? Because mm. I'm going to be involved with one thing. Someone who gives me and I give them a shot to make it. A shot. Don't, there's no guarantee in this business. I'm not asking for a guarantee. That's, that's crazy. All I'm saying is a shot to make it. What's that mean, a shot? That means that you're going to do and live up to your commitments. When you start breaking appointments and not being reliable, you're not doing that. You're, you're not a guy that'll give me a shot. I'll go get a guy who might not be as talented as you, but will give me a run for the money. We'll do everything. And that's what I want out of you. And if you stop being that, then there's going to be a problem. All right? And there's no reason for you to stop being that. That's the least you could do. That's the least you could do. Because that's simply and easily in your control. We'll give our remarks to Johnny Yeah, please. Nice meeting you. Good luck. You're a tough guy. Boxing has helped make Las Vegas what Las Vegas is. They get the very, very best that this sport can offer. The heavyweight championship of the world. Not only do they get it, it's expected that it will be held here. Welcome to Caesars Palace, the most spectacular casino resort in the world. And welcome to the most colossal slot empire you've ever encountered. There's a lot of people betting on this fight. When I first heard that it was taking place, Evander Holyfield, a seven to one favorite, that price right now is down to five to one. Uh, people are betting Larry Holmes. A lot of people feel he ha they, that he has a legitimate chance to win, you know, and regain the heavyweight title. Uh, and I foresee that continuing. We've taken uh, some pretty good substantial bets, $10,000 and $20,000 wagers early on Larry Holmes. Would not surprise me to see some $50,000 or $100,000 wages bet possibly on both fighters. No sodas, no pretzels. What kind of shit is this? What are you doing? Yeah, sure, for yourself. We have a tremendous emotional stake because we started with Evander when he was a 21-year-old kid. And now he's a 29-year-old heavyweight champion of the world. Like Bob Arum, he just started promoting Larry Holmes one fight ago. If he wins, he makes money. Caesars is guaranteed us five and a half million. Then there's the foreign rights, about two and a half million dollars. There's the closed circuit television. That accounts for another $2 million. The biggest revenue stream is on pay-per-view television, between 44 and $50 million. Holyfield uh, gets $18.5 million, and uh, Larry Holmes, $7 million. The uh, celebrity interview location is going to be down over here. What we've asked them to do is, once the canopy and lighting trusses are in place, Proper height. Can't do it this way. This is too disorganized. Too much money and too goddamn disorganized. Which I mean, this is stupid this way. This is no good. That's just how they're distributed. God, who's paying for what? That's one of the bottom. Fine, I'll take a look at the main events and make a list. That's what you should do. As a promoter, the one thing that you want to do is create controversy. And I and I think what's happened is that he probably hasn't taken it for this fight if he took it before. But you don't spend fifty thousand dollars on two ads in USA Today saying steroids baloney when it costs you $15 to piss in a bottle and you're in Houston and getting a hospital to certify that you're okay. Bob Arum's always desperately trying to drum up something. You know, I don't, I'm not speaking about his personal life, but in terms of business, he might be one of the most amoral people on planet Earth. Uh, he just will do absolutely anything to sell a fight, say anything, discredit people, spread rumors, and then after it's over, he'll say, what the heck, I was trying to sell a fight, you know? Bob Arum is very 
very insensitive to boxers. Oh, he's, he loves them as long as they're making him a couple of bucks. But the minute they're out of grace, it's like a tissue, throw it away and move on. He once said this to me, Butch, you have a tendency to fall in love with the boxers. And boxers come and go. We can do what we do until we, whenever we want to retire. But the boxers don't fall in love with the boxers. Jesus, ba ba ba. has always had a streak of petulance on him. I think Holmes is now a better fighter than Foreman was when he fought him here. The problem was that nobody likes Larry. I call myself the Eastern Assassin. And for years I didn't live up to that name. But now I'm back. Good. Ow. Oh. Oh. I'm gonna do this. Come on. Get off me, Holyfield. Walk to him. Touch your glove. Touch that one. Touch that one. 15! Friday night, y'all gonna be shocked at what this old, old man's gonna do. What floor is the commission? I forget. Opponents in boxing are a very valuable commodity. Their job is to lose. Does that mean the fight's fixed? No. They don't have to be fixed. If you get the right opponent, it's de facto fixed, you know? I mean, these guys don't have a, a prayer, a prayer of winning. And everybody did it. I did it. Mike Marley's doing it. Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton did it with Mike Tyson. I mean, some of those people that Tyson fought in his early fights, as good as Tyson was, they were barely breathing. I mean, some of these guys, the way you give them the physical before the fight, you put a mirror under their nose and you see if there's a vapor that comes out on it. If they're alive, you throw them in the ring with your fighter. <laughs> No, no, no. This is his second fight. He's going to want Shannon Oh, uh, He's 68 inches. We want a guy in there who is presentable physically. Uh, we prefer that he be under the age of 65. And uh, he must, in New York, pass very stringent medical exams. Uh, the CAT scan, the CT scan, and then an eye exam, which must be done by an ophthalmologist. He's 205 pounds. My feeling is if a boxer could spell, properly spell ophthalmologist, they ought to pass him. Medically, you're okay. The head, cabeza is uh, bueno. Yeah. Corazon is bueno. Yeah. <laughs> eh, perfecto, perfecto. Thank you. Mucha suerte, but not too much suerte. And now, my good friends, introducing the principles. First, in the room corner. Give me 50 of those. 50 of these. That would be great to give out to fans. Yeah, look at that. That's great. Ollie's making a great face. Yeah. Now I'm, gonna, I'm getting 
a hundred of every one, and we're getting eight by tens, five by sevens. I know you, you'll be handing them out oh, in the, in the airport. Is that what? That's the one that Pretty Lady <laughs> shot. Which, which one is that? And that one I got to get in Jet magazine. Ooh, yeah, that's, that's definitely for Jet. Yeah, Hairstyle. That's where. That's huh. where he said, I, huh. if, I, if I fought you, I would have called you pretty lady. It's great, man. I got a guy called me today on it. Yeah. Shannon Briggs' purse will be $500. Uh, Shannon already is starting to scare so many potential opponents away uh, that we're paying the opponent more than we're paying Shannon Briggs. Take this, and then I'm giving you the universe. So that'll be 100 So, uh... So after the fight, you'll have 550 coming, right? Six. No, I'll give you a hundred. I give you a hundred. Right, and you told me you give. I, I told you I give you 650 total. No, you told me you, you give me the six plus a hundred. All right, make it seven. Your guy's gonna put up a fight, right? Yeah. He's gonna throw punches in the fight hall. That's what we're here for. You find the opponent, and you pay his plane fare, you pay his hotel bill, and then you pay his purse. And that's the price of doing business. And the goal, the reward, is the pot of gold at the end you're hoping for. Check one, two, check one, two. It's the 96 Rock Wake Up Crew. Let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> That's great. That's great. And one more rumble for uh, TV, and then I'm out of your hair for the rest of your life. Do keep this one for Eyewitness News in Atlanta, Georgia. Let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> Bob, listen, get Take going. Get after that Bye. media a little bit. Get after, tell him uh, that he really didn't use star. <laughs> We're just trying to get everybody. Uh, but one going. thing, when, when Larry knocks out a van, when Larry knocks out a van, I'm not going to say I told you so. Okay, thanks, Bob. Bob here. <laughs> He's in real good spirits. Good, good spirits. Strong. Had, a, had like a four pancakes this morning, a couple eggs, you know. Have you ever had anything embarrassing happen to you when you go up there holding the cards way up high? Well, sometimes the fighters are very nice before the fight, but when they're in the ring, they're nervous and they're intense and they want to win the fight and they're sweating and they may have a hurt nose or a hurt lip or something. And as I walk by them, I have noticed a lot that they're, you know, they're bleeding and they give this look like, get out of the ring, Alicia, get out of the ring. All right, Alicia, thanks a lot. Good luck tonight Welcome. in the Hall of Field Holmes fight. This is uh, D-Day. This is uh, the day of the fight. We're at the, uh, going into the uh, weigh-in. How much is this monster going to weigh? He's growing by the day. Shannon Briggs, I must admit, is a little bit under the weather. Shannon's got some congestion in the chest area, but he'll overcome that. He'll be ready to fight. So uh, let's get ready to rumble. Santos, 196. A good weight. I told the doctor, he said, don't take any more of these today. I had to tell him, yeah, because they, they have a test. Yeah. It's OK. Yeah. He said, it's fine. He said, but you shouldn't take any more until after the fight. Your imagination has a lot to do with this thing we call fear. And your imagination is really taxed and really used when you're waiting to get ready for a fight because the hours before is nothing but imagination. And it's uncontrolled imagination sometimes. What could happen? And the things that could happen are always imagined as worse than the reality of the doing. You need your rest. If you're, you know, it's like burning in at both ends. You gotta get your rest. So when you get back, you get on a program, a schedule where you're, you're getting your right rest yeah. and, and you're not going out doing all these other 
things at night. You you be in in the house, you know. Yeah. Resting. <coughs> Flush. Sorry. Sorry. Ah. Just want to make sure you walk far enough to let the food digest a little. Make sure you get everything, your mouthpiece. Yeah, it's all in the bag. Everything's in there. Things in the bag. Go over a couple. This is what they say in the dress room, but you're going to be able to beat him to the punch. If he throws anything wide before he closes the distance, beat him to the punch with something short or something straight. All right? Yeah. That's it. You're going set. Let me just get my stuff. We'll go. I'm one of the most superstitious people in the world, and as a result, everyone around me is extremely superstitious, because I make them be. So we will wear probably the same clothes right down to our socks that we wore for Vander Holyfield's last successful title fight, and then we will just go down to the arena and bite our fingernails down to the uh, bone and waiting for the fight to start. Well, how does that song go down? I had not soon enough. I gotta tell you, the Lord helps him all the time, and I don't know how he gets these things arranged. <laughs> He's in the hot corner. Well, the Holyfield Vander's in the hot, hot Vander's in the hot corner. Hey, Doc. I got uh, heavyweight Shannon Briggs in a second, but I just wanted to uh, let you know he used a little uh, Afrin uh, like an hour ago, just a nasal spray. Okay. Okay, just you know, did a few blasts of that. He doesn't want it to be embarrassing. That's why I he's understand that. So that, but I'm telling you what to say to him. Yeah. You, you, I know what to say to him. I told him. You know, what? I said, we'll get the guy out of there. Yeah, the first it will look bad. I, mean, I don't want to talk so openly, but I told him, I said, it'll be a one round fight. And the guy will get hit. And, yeah. You know, it's not going to be. Go last, that's all. I understand. That's what I told him. So, you know, as long as the fans get, see a good fight. That's what matters. We care about the fans, right, Tom? Fuck the fans. Yeah. 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 Hold it against my stomach prop. Yeah. Push a little bit. That's it. Yeah. 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 You know what I mean by yeah. that? You're getting a chance to do it without that kind of caliber opponent, yeah. but with the conditions, you being handicapped in different ways. Yeah. So you're gonna have to act like a real pro. I got you, so this man. is your first test of being a pro. Be a pro. It's a nice roll. Nice color. Yeah, it's you nice design, too. Huh? Let's go. Oh. Let's go. Oh, I see. Let's go. Break. Yeah. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from the site where legends are made, Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, 12 rounds of boxing for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. Challenger, Ray. Oh! And your opponent fighting out of the blue 
corner. Wearing the gold trunks with white trim, weighing in at an even 210 pounds. The two-time world champion and current undefeated. Now, like a pro, all right? Everything's right. It's nice and cool in here. You'll be ready. Should be nice and awake now. Come on, let's go. Not a nice person, or he's suspect, or he's he's morally um, questionable. But that's like cannibals discussing table manners. There's there's that basic part of every person that wants to see someone defend themselves, or, or see someone stop someone else. And when we prey upon that, actually, the people that are all around boxing, the writers, the managers, the promoters, the seconds. Some of us with less blood on our hands than others, but all a little bit bloody. Hi, this is Michael Morley. Who's this? Hey, Barry, what's up, my man? Hey, listen, I got a fight result for you. Shannon Briggs scored a knockout tonight in uh, Troy, New York. He's 4-0 as a pro. Shannon Briggs from Brooklyn, the heavyweight, 20 years old. That's B-R-I-G-G-S. Shannon Knox. 